Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. Th this is going to be a little bit of audience participation in, uh, in this uh, session. If all goes well and the technology works, it's just possible that you'll be able to do some of our exercises online. I tried them on a, on a smartphone and that does, does work. I think the iPhone is a little small and the Blackberry is definitely too small. But if you've got a Nexus or a Samsung or a tablet, you should be able to do some of the exercises that will be coming up. There are about four altogether. We won't get through all four. Uh, we may do uh, two, we may only do one. But they're all in the handouts, which I assume you've got uh, access to. So you can do them in your own time if we don't do them this afternoon. Uh, we're going to look at how to model staffing dynamics. I'm going to give you a simple example as the, as the first exercise and how to model the changes in experience that go with the changes in the number of people in the situation. And we're going to follow that up by looking at the rather important issue that we're not planning HR in isolation, we're planning HR in order to support what the business is trying to do. Right? So we need a, a mutually consistent way of modeling what the business is trying to do with what the HR is actually making possible so that we can have a sensible conversation about what is possible uh, from both sides of that conversation. We're going to look at very briefly at the issue of reporting uh, human resources and the limits that there are to what you can do with that. And we'll end, if we, if we get this far, with looking at the issue of staff pipelines and how the earlier principles uh, can be pushed on to look at staff pipeline uh, structures. And I'll just end with a few uh, words about the many other things you can do with, uh, with this method. So here's a little, a little quiz for you. I know it's 4.30, uh, I know you've had a long day, but if you could just chat with the person next to you and uh, just give me your idea of what the answer is to this question. This is a, a company with 50 salespeople and they're, they're operating in China, the market's growing very fast and they want to grow that sales force to 200 people after five years. Unfortunately, because of the intense competition in the marketplace, they're losing 30% of people a year. So just tell me this, how many people have they got to hire every quarter? Just a clue here, there are 20 quarters in five years. <laughs> so who's going to be brave and give me, uh, give me their estimate? Go on. 34. 34 per quarter? Uh, per quarter. Per quarter? 34 per quarter. So in total, you're going to be hiring 680 people in order to end up with 200. Okay. Any, uh, any alternative estimates here? Yeah? 11. 11. 11. 34. 11. Has anyone got any other numbers that they've, they've got? Oh, <laughs> Eight and a half. Twenty. Okay. Right. Well, it, it's clearly difficult because you're, you're starting with a smallish size of team, and losing thirty percent of a smallish size of team is losing less people than it will be when you've got a big team, and then you're losing thirty percent of those. So it's uh, it's not not a trivial sum to do, but you you should be able to get somewhere near the right answer. But let's uh, just have a a look at this. Um, any of you who can get online, if you go to that URL there sdl.re m502 you should be able to get that on your phone or your tablet or your pc or whatever how, how many there now okay good 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 right when you get there you should see uh, 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 lower down in the picture there's some other stuff we'll look at in a bit but basically at the top of the picture you'll see this, this box and there's a red line in that and that's the line that we want to hit that's the growth from 50 people to, to 200 people. And on the right-hand side is a, a pipe out of which people are leaving, and they're, they're leaving at an increasing rate because there are more of them. And in at the left is the hiring, which is uh, a constant. I've set it at, at 10. So the thing to do is on the left-hand side, you should see this control panel. So the first thing to do is hit reset on that control panel. And then... Click in this box on the number of staff hired and put in whatever number you, you think it, it should be. So you could either put in 8.5 or 11 or 34. Uh, and 
When you put in the number you think will get you to our target of 200, just click the, uh, the play button. So I will go over and do that right now. Click reset, put in uh, the number you think it is. Let's put in 8.5 and see how far that gets us. And if you play it, you see it just plays out over 20 quarters and eight and a half people gets us to 99. Okay, uh, reset again. Maybe 15 is enough. 15, oh, nearly, nearly, nearly. Gets to 166. We, we're going pretty well at first, but then the, the attrition rate kind of takes over and, and we just don't quite get there. 18, someone got there. <laughs> 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 Eight, who said 18? Yeah, yeah, 18 is pretty pretty close. That's about the, the right number. All right, so this HR dynamic stuff is actually quite tricky. You know, even that very simple sum is already beginning to, oh gosh, I can't quite work that out. And you, you can see that the, the situation is changing over time. You can't go with a, with a single number and, it, and it'll always stay the same and always get you where you want to be. This is going to get a bit difficult, right? So that's the question that you just answered. How many to hire to reach 200 by year five? What's going on here? Well, that box that we looked at is called a stock. The, the mathematical term for it is an, an accumulating asset stock. Anything that is, is things or stuff fills up and drains away over time. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about rabbits in a field, water in a lake, money in your bank account, motivation amongst your people. They're all asset stocks. They fill up and drain away. And this is the icon that shows that. Think of it as a tank. And at part way through that scenario I just showed you, we had 95 people at the end of one quarter and that increased to 98 at the end of the next quarter. So that's the number of the staff at a point in time. You measure what's in the stock at points of time. It doesn't make any sense to define it in any other terms. Coming in from the left is the rate at which stuff is flowing into that tank. It's called a flow rate, unsurprisingly. And that is running at a rate per period of time. So 10 people per quarter are flowing into that tank. So that must mean that on the right hand side, seven people per quarter are leaving, right? So just keep that analogy in your mind all the time. We've got stocks of things and we've got flows and the flows are the things we control. You can't change the stock any other way than by changing the flows. So if someone says to you, we've got 100 engineers, we need 150, you can't do that. All you can do is hire and work on the, on the attrition, right? It's the flow rates you control, not the stock. And then you basically carry on the same arithmetic quarter after quarter. Now, uh, th this isn't rocket science. It, it's essentially simple sums. But as you can see from that simple exercise we just did, it gets quite tricky. And it's going to get trickier still as the, as the session goes on. Now in this, the flow rates are critical. So in scenario A, we've gone from 95 to 98 people. In scenario B, we've gone from 95 to 98 people. In scenario C, we've gone from 95 to 98 people. Are those situations the same? Absolutely not. That's a very different world in which we hire 10 and lose seven, hire three and lose none, hire 30 and lose 27. Those, that's not the same. The stock has changed by the same amount, but the implications of those different flow rates are extremely serious. And that doesn't just apply in the HR world. That would be the same if we were talking about the stock of a company's customers. Right? If we had 95 customers and won 30 and lost 27, you know, we would not be, not be too pleased. Those two numbers in the stock are the same in each case, but the numbers flowing in and out are different and the difference really, really matters. So let's get a bit more real about this particular case we just looked at. This is a real case. It concerns uh, the manufacturer of electrical equipment, uh, one of the big guys in, in the industry, who has a growing and successful business in China. And that is why the turnover rate is 30%, because the, the local Chinese companies are targeting this global producer to take away their experienced staff. That's why they've got the problem. It's slightly more serious than just losing people. It's the quality of people that we're worried about as well. 
staff quality matters as well as quantity. And what this organization knows is that their, their salespeople really become effective after about three years of experience. So what they want is people with three years experience. They don't just want 200 people, they want 200 people with three years experience. And the way to think about this picture, think of this as a bathtub, you know, you, you're going to have a bath and you would rather that your bath was full than half full. You would also rather that your bath was warm and not cold. So experience is how warm the water is. Now, if your bath is too cold, you've basically got three options. First option is to put hot water in it. So in this case, that means hiring experienced people. Right? So could we go out and hire people with an average of, say, five years experience? Well, that's going to be difficult. They just aren't there. The, the other thing you could do is you can take cold water out of your bath to make room for more, more hot water. So maybe you could let out some cold water so you can put some more hot in. Um, that's not going to work either because we, we will have nobody at all if we do that. Uh, the third option is actually to heat up the bath directly. I don't recommend you try this at home, but you, you could get a waterproof heater and stick it in the bath and that would make it hotter. Right? So those are your three options. Add hot, heat it up, or take out cold. So add experience, grow the experience more quickly somehow, or take out the cold. You know, make sure it's only the least experienced people you lose rather than the most. So here is our scenario. You can see the, the blue line has got us to 114 people, not 200. And the average experience, which is the heat in the bath divided by the water, is only 1.96. It's less than two years. The average person has less than two years experience. And in fact, it's less than, it's less than we started with. We started with people with two years experience. So the combination of trying to hire to grow our people and losing the people with lots of experience means that we don't get any increase in our experience at all. We've got one good thing going for us, and that is every year everybody has a birthday. So each year that goes by, you add one to the average experience of the people in the, in the stock. So we've got very tough competition for staff. Down at the bottom, our competitors are not taking our average people. They're taking our best people. They're taking the people who have got two years more experience than average. What we end up with is barely half the staff we need and with low experience. So how much do we have to change things to hit what we want? This story is already played out two years. Two years in, we're already behind where we want to be. If you go to your model again, hit reset once again, and just hit the step button until you get to time eight. Let me show you that. So hit reset, step, 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 step. That's the... And then set whatever hiring number you want and whatever turnover number you want and see what you have to do to get to 200 people and three years average experience over there. Right? Let me give you a couple of minutes to try that. How much do you have to cut that turnover rate and how fast do you have to hire to hit 200 people with three years average experience? That there's more than one answer to this question, by the way, because you've got two degrees of freedom on your, on your decision. Okay, here's my best effort, which is uh, if I can cut turnover to 20% for the last three years, and higher at the rate of 20, I, I certainly get the number I want, um, but I'm still way, way behind on the, on the experience that I need. And we, we get the point, right? That this is even that simple strategy that you're trying to, to achieve is not easy because you've got interactions between these accumulating stocks going on, and you've got different factors playing in. We haven't even touched what the experience is of the people you hire 
or the average experience of the people you lose. That's already a complicated problem, right? It's already a complicated problem. The question is, if you don't do it like this, how else do you do it? So there's something about the way in which these dynamics and these interdependencies work that is just plain difficult. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little later that there are some features of, of the way the world works that mean that the mathematics of this is the only way to do it. This is not the only technology that, that can do it. Agent-based modelling and discrete event modelling both do the same thing because they tackle the same problems. But they're just appropriate in slightly different circumstances. That's what you've just done. And the kind of practical insight from this is you've got to hit turnover a lot. You've got to really press down on turnover to stand any chance of getting the level of experience that you need for that, for that team. The particular company that we're talking about here struggled with, with this for some time. And eventually, they, they didn't quite manage to get the kind of growth that they really wanted. But the one thing this company did have going for it is that being a global company, it was able to offer international experience for the people in this team and to backfill the experience of this team with Im imported talent from other parts of the East Asia uh, region. I guess this is quite a familiar, serious challenge for any of you who work in, in fast growth sectors. Uh, but this is kind of how you have to, to think through the numbers. But we've looked at a very simple staffing dynamic in its own terms. Now we want to re recognize the fact that we're not planning HR in isolation. HR is part of a business system. And when you apply the same method to the whole of a business, this is the kind of picture that you end up with. This is a kind of generic template, if you like, that describes many kinds of businesses. On the right-hand side, you've got profit. Profit comes from revenue minus costs. Revenue comes from the sales volume that you sell multiplied by the price at which you sell it. Where do sales come from? Sales come from customers, and customers are won and lost in the same kind of way as staff are hired and turn over. So your price decision is one of the things that says, does a customer want to buy from you or not? Customers want to buy from you if you offer the products that they want or the services that they want, and if you do marketing to persuade them to become your customer, and all of that generates sales. But you only get those sales if you can fulfill the demand that's coming from those customers. Now, where does that capacity come from? Well, that comes from having enough people and from having the physical and logistical capacity to actually get the stuff to them. Uh, you can adapt this to service businesses, but basically the principles are essentially the same. And then those costly resources, we, we, we call these things here the supply side resources, this is the demand side resource. This is about the simplest possible model of a business that you can get. Very nearly the simplest, I'm going to show you an even simpler one uh, in, in a moment. But this can be adapted to all kinds of different um, organisations. Your, your business will be different. There'll be things that don't fit quite like this uh, for you. But just bear this model in mind as we go on to the next bit. Because this time we're going to look at um, a, a mid-sized IT support firm. Now this is actually a service provider in the marketplace, but it could equally be a service provider department within a business. Okay? You can have exactly the same kind of issue inside a bigger business, but this, this is a, a third party provider. And this is the story over 36 months. They took on a new business development person to go and sign up for more clients. They were doing quite well, they were making money, their service was good, uh, their clients were very happy, so the business development guy went off and, and started signing up new customers. And at first he was quite successful for about you know, three to six months. But you'll notice that the stock of clients grew up to, I think it grew up to about 100 or something, but then it started to fall. So if the guy's been winning customers on the left-hand side, the only way it can fall is if, if what? Something else must be happening. They're leaving, yeah, we're losing customers. So why are we losing customers? Those clients drive that service demand. That service demand grew to exceed the capacity of the people to fulfill that demand. That meant that they were under pressure, which meant that they made mistakes. 
which meant that the clients were experiencing problems, which means that the clients eventually said, hey, I've had enough of this, I'm going. And previously, you noticed there weren't any people going. The clients were very happy. But now we've got a situation where they're not very happy. So workload rises, exceeding staff capacity, and the increased pressure on the staff hits the service quality. Now what should happen next is that this problem should fix itself, shouldn't it? Without you doing anything else, the problem ought to go away. Yeah, because you've now got fewer customers, you've actually got fewer customers than you started with. So the problem should fix itself. Um, it doesn't look like it really has. It, it's got quite a bit better, but it hasn't really fixed itself. And the reason it hasn't fixed itself is that down at the bottom, that work pressure actually drove uh, increasing turnover on the staff. So how do we know all this was happening? Well, go and talk to the guy who owns the business, and he'll tell you that during this period here, you know, people were working late, the lights were on all night, people were working weekends, and you know, he actually knows when people hand in their resignations. There's no, there's no mystery here, there's nothing unknown about the situation. And he certainly knows when clients call up and say, you know, I want to complain because that software you just installed for me is a load of cows doo doos. Right? Um, so everything on this picture is no. We're not, we're not dealing here with any kind of arm waving intangible factors like you know, feelings about this or commitment to that. We've actually got numbers on all this stuff. Here's the situation. Um, what we want to do is we want to keep all the clients that we win. So we want to go with the business development guy's sales effort and we want to make sure that we provide enough staff that the service capacity is high enough that we don't lose any of those. So if you go to sdl.re M4A03, that's what you should see. And you should be used to the routine by now. Click reset, set the staff hiring, and click play, or, or just end. There's 36 months here, so if you click play, it'll take quite a while to play it all out month by month. You can just hit the end button, it'll do the same thing. So your question is, how many do you have to hire to keep all the clients you win? That's, that's all, we, all we need to know. And you can put in a fractional number. It doesn't have to be just two or three or five. You can put in 2.2 or 6.8 or whatever. So I put in 2.3. That wasn't, clearly wasn't enough. Two point six wasn't enough. Anyone got me a number that works? Let's just see if, if three is more than I need. Oh no, no, I did need three. I definitely needed three. Um, even with three, I've got a little bit of, of um, pressure in the middle, a little bit to uh, uh, a little bit of client losses in the middle there as well. We we eventually kind of catch up, but uh, it's three point something I think to, to get there. Now, of course. The, the other thing that that's doing is that if you start hiring three, there's going to be a period early on where you've actually got more people than you need, and that's going to be expensive. So you're not going to make as much profit as you would have done if you got the, the right number all the way through. What we've got here, then, is we've got the demand coming from the customer side of the business. This is the demand side of the business. This is the supply side. This is you, as the HR professionals, making sure that business has got the capacity of people it needs to fulfill what's going on up here. And notice, by the way, demand does not just come from the number of customers you've got. It comes from the way you're winning them as well. When an IT department gets new customers, when an IT firm gets new customers, the first thing it has to do is go and work out what the situation is that they're taking on. So they, tend, they send in a busload of people to figure out what they just bought, right? Okay, we've got demand here coming from how many customers we've got and the win rate. So do you have this conversation with your commercial side of the business? Tell me how much demand you want me as the HR provider to make sure that you can fulfill. And when they answer that question, are they doing it like this? I think a lot of them are doing it with the finger in the air. This is just not good enough. We can do better than this. The conversation that should have happened here goes as follows. 
CEO to HR people, here's what we're going to do. Get us what we need. To which the HR person's response should have been, the organisation can't do that. And here's what will go wrong if you try. Not exactly, but in principle, you can be pretty sure if you start pushing customers into this business, there will come a point where these people can't cope. And when these people can't cope, those customers will get bad service and these people will get stressed and leave. Just that is enough to raise the red flag and say, hey, just, just hold on here. So the second part of the conversation should have been, the organisation can't do that, here's what will go wrong if you try, but give us three months and it will be possible. Because in those three months, what will we do? We will hire and develop the capacity to be able to take this on when the guy presses the sale button. So it's not just a question of how much to do, it's how much to do when, and how to keep changing that, because the world is constantly changing, right? There is no single number that will always keep working, uh, in this function or in any other. So what should we be doing? Well, we should be accounting for these important resources. You know, every business I know does this. What's the cash at the start of the year? How much cash came in? How much cash went out? And how much cash was there at the end of the year? Quite a lot of companies do not do this. Here's the number of customers we had at the start of the quarter. Here's the number of customers we won, customers we lost, and the number of customers. That's a customer flow statement. We've got a cash flow statement. Customers are an asset. Why don't we have a, a, a customer flow statement? And how many of you do this? Well, I've lost count of the number of annual reports where I read something like, oh, people are our most important asset. Well, if they are your most important asset, why don't you account for them in the same way as you do for cash? What are the gains? What are the losses? And why don't you do it by team, by function, and by level? The beauty about cash is that every £10 note is essentially the same. The difficulty with customers and with people is that they're not all the same. Right? So just one cash flow statement is OK, but you actually need lots of staff flow statements for each of the different kinds of people. So it'll be different for your R&D staff, for your sales staff, for your operations staff. Right? And it's not just the number you need to report, it's also the quality of those people. So what's happened to the changes in experience? Back in with that sales force, has the average experience gone up or down during that quarter? And why? And this is what such a statement might look like. Uh, this is simply a spreadsheet showing the numbers of staff hired and lost and the numbers you've got. This is a quarterly people flow statement. Uh, do, how many of you provide your management teams with a people flow statement on a regular basis? Ah, oh, cool, excellent, great. I knew if I came to a HR analytics conference, I'd find some people who were doing this stuff properly. Right, that's great. Very good. Well, every organization should. Many, many don't. That's a kind of staff flow equivalent to the cash flow uh, approach. But there are limits to what you can do by trying to do the financial and, and accounting analogy uh, with people. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to imagine for a moment that you would like to put a value on your people, right? You'd like to quantify the, the financial value of your human capital. And now, that's quite a difficult thing to do. So let's go to a rather simpler situation where somebody wants to understand the value of their, of their human capital. And this is Jensen Button going around the Malaysian Grand Prix at 185 miles per hour. And McLaren would like to know how much Jensen Button contributes to that 185 miles per hour. And they do some statistical analysis and they figure out that the tyres contribute 35 miles per hour, the steering contributes 25 miles per hour, and the engine contributes 80, which must mean that the driver contributes 45. So by a simple process of arithmetic, what you can work out is that the car without the driver would go around the track at 140 miles an hour. Now, that sounds ludicrous, but when the finance people try to put a, a financial value on people or brand or, frankly, anything else, that's what they're doing. 
that's what they're pretending they can do. What we can do, though, is we can assess what difference a change might make. So we can work out what the impact of better tyres might be. Better tyres might make a car go from 185 to 187. Improved steering might make it go from 187 to 188. A better driver might make it go from 188 to 190. Yeah? You, can, you can assess the differential impact but you can't work out the absolute. And the reason it doesn't work is it's the system that drives performance, the system that creates value. But we can estimate what difference more or better people can make. And sometimes we can buy or buy access to better human resources. Uh, it's very common in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, to uh, ally with other drugs companies in order to exploit the value of their sales force if your sales force can't access the channels that, that you need. And, and this issue is not restricted to uh, human capital reporting. Uh, Interbrand, for example, tells me that the Coca-Cola brand is, set, is worth $79 billion. Well, Coca-Cola Inc. is worth $170 billion. So Coca-Cola without the brand is worth $91 billion. What, what does Coca-Cola without its brand actually mean? It's a, it's a meaningless concept. So I don't understand why people try to do this, but it, it seems to be uh, very fashionable. Okay, um, staff pipeline issues. I don't need to tell you guys this. They can be very serious. Here's one such story. Royal Dutch Shell got into trouble in 2005 with the, Euro with the US Securities and Exchange Commission for misreporting their oil reserves. That wasn't a financial misreporting, it was a technical problem because they didn't have enough petroleum engineers. So they started a drive to hire a thousand experienced petroleum engineers. Anyone here in the oil industry? Yeah? I'm working at Shell. Okay, yeah. oh, okay. Oh, dear me. All right. So tell me, does 1,000 experienced petroleum engineers sound to you, you keep quiet, <laughs> does that sound to you like a lot of people or not very many people? Um, it's three times the annual graduation rate of all US petroleum engineering degree programs. So basically it couldn't be done. Uh, but after many years under recruitment in the industry, what's happened is that, engine, that, is that young, talented, technical people have chosen other careers. So it's not Shell who is short of a thousand petroleum engineers. The whole industry is short of tens of thousands. In 2005, you haven't got enough petroleum engineers. If you haven't got enough experienced people in 2005, when did you not hire them? 1995. Right? Ten years, that's the kind of time. Right? Something like that. If you didn't hire them in 1995, uh, why, why did you not hire them in 1995? Uh, I'll spin the story through. Because they weren't there. They weren't graduating. Why were they not graduating in 1995? But that's as easy as this is just. Yeah, they, they didn't go into the programs in 1991. They didn't go into the programs in 1991 because no one was hiring in 1990. So here you are, 15 years later, paying a price, and the whole industry doing this, paying a price for a strategic mistake you made 15 years before. The power sector faced a very similar problems, so severe that RWE, the, the big German company, actually uh, sponsored three universities to start electrical engineering degree programs so that they could hire the people that were going to be trained by those degree programs. So here's a framework that you can work this all out with. You've got a stock of um, experienced people and some of those people are leaving, some of them are becoming experienced from being trainees, and some of the trainees are leaving. So we are reducing our number of employees and this is known as the Rookie Pro model. Uh, now, pipelines get more complex than this. Uh, now, we're not going to have time to do this, but this is an exercise you can do for yourself. This is a pipeline for a different kind of engineering company. 50 project leaders, 200 engineers, and 400 technicians. With these turnover rates, these promotion rates, and this hiring decision for technicians. So. Just figure out for yourself what you think will happen to the number of people in those boxes over 10 years. Uh, maybe do this you know, on the train on the way home or something. Get a pen out and just 
draw in that picture what you think will happen, you will find that this is problematic, right? This is not a good this is not a good world. And if you want to, you can go to this URL. You can see what will happen if those numbers continue. And you can try your hand at changing the policies to improve the outcome. So this is a particular challenge I, I would give to you, which is what hiring, promotion, and turnover rates? You will have to do something about the turnover rates. You will have to actually fire people to make this possible. Double the size of the organization in 10 years and keep the same profile. One to four to eight. OK, so staff pipelines breed senior staff. That's what, what they do. So the, the message from this exercise is you have to grow to create opportunities for senior people or else move out senior people in order to make space for people coming up from below, which is why consulting firms op operate this kind of up or out policy that's so derided. But if you don't do it, you're, you're left with a moribund uh, structure. Th this is why this is difficult. Critical factors accumulate. There's much interdependence and feedback in the system. And there are thresholds that we have to, uh, to deal with as well. This method deals with that explicitly. And uh, here are some of the other things you can get out of uh, applying this method to, to extend it. You know, add experience and cost to the pipeline. We can deal with migration of staff from one part of business to another. And one of my students very cleverly applied the same method to uh, the idea of adopting change in an organization and we can uh, handle um, capabilities and, and learning. And uh, just leave you with this final message. We now have both the method and the technology to simulate all significant management decisions. I submit it is therefore irresponsible of us not to do so. Okay.